blessing on this word. Lord, we thank you for tonight. I thank you for your presence here. Holy Spirit, as, as your anointing is in this place. And I thank you, Lord, even now, as we get into the word of the Lord, that Holy Spirit, you move powerfully upon every one of us that are going to be getting into the word of the Lord to give you our best ear, our full attention, our focus. Jesus said, it's better that I go away. I'll send the Holy Spirit. He will teach you. And so we need the, the Holy Spirit to help us understand. And so, Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit touching our hearts and minds and helping us have eyes and ears of the Spirit that we can see and hear. As you speak through me, Lord, everything that needs to be said, nothing uh, lacking, that everything that needs to be said will go out as living seeds of truth sown into good soil, watered by the Holy Spirit, take root, go and produce a hundredfold harvest of eternal fruit that remains in Jesus' name, and that everything be accomplished in the, through this time in the word that your will to be done. Lord, we, we take authority. We bind anything of the enemy that would try to hinder this word from getting where it's supposed to accomplish and what's supposed to be commit to be bound and go from us in Jesus' name. Go from this word. And Lord, I thank you that this will not return void, but it will go forth and accomplish everything you sent it for it to do. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank you for it now. Amen. All right, so we're going to talk tonight about covenant rights as God's book, Covenant People. The sermon I'm really comfortable with preaching, but I do have some notes to go through. And I want you to just take notice of something up front. Whenever I had time to talk with Steve Hill, I think it was 2003, him and I had sat and talked for a while, and then he prayed with me. But I remember I was asking him some questions. <clears throat> And one of the questions I asked him was, what have you learned about prayer? And he told me, he said, well, there's a lot of people that talk about prayer, but not everybody does it. And so, and, and that was really all that he left it at. He didn't have much more to say, but I thought about that. And I was like, of all the different things that Brother Steve could have told me about prayer was basically this. Don't just talk about it, but do it. And I'd asked him too, I think I've shared this before, but just for those that maybe have never heard this, I said, there's a lot of different things we talked about, but I asked him, I said, so what have you learned about the anointing? And he said, well, let me tell you what I learned about the anointing. He said, one time I was praying for all these people and it's late, late into the night. I was exhausted and I had nothing else to give. And there was this whole group of people that were still needing me to pray for them. So I told them to all just stand up here. Let's join hands. And it was like a big giant circle. And I said, touch them, Lord, you know, and the power of God hit all of them. They all went out into the power and I went home. And then, wait, there's more. And then he said, some time later, the same scenario. He said, I was super exhausted. We had been going for late into the night after night after night in this revival. And he said, again, I was just so tired. And there was still a group of people want me to pray for him. And so I said, all right. Everybody come over here, join hands, touch them, Lord. He said, nothing happened. He said, that's what I've learned about the anointing. Just let that sink in for a little bit. So basically what he's saying there is that you can't control the anointing. You can't turn it on and off when you want to. You have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. But anyway, back to prayer. Many talk about it, but few really do it. So he's saying, make sure that you don't just talk about prayer, but we are people of prayer. I know and you know that a praying Christian is a powerful Christian. And a praying church is a powerful church. But the opposite is true. Christians that don't have any type of prayer life whatsoever are weak spiritually. And you know it and I know it. And churches that don't have prayer in them are vulnerable to the enemy. So I'm going to share a couple things tonight. The pattern established at Passover. Passover, this was the first of God's feasts. And out of Passover, we have the communion table, which is like an abbreviation of the Passover meal that's celebrated every year. The communion table is just kind of like a very short version of it. But listen to what Jesus said here in Matthew 26, 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. 
Then he took the cup, and after he gave thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink all of it, all of you, or drink of it, all of you, rather, for this is my blood of what? The new covenant. Everybody say covenant. Now, that's what I want to talk about because a lot of people don't, in America, have no idea what a covenant is. But he said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it with you in my father's kingdom and when they had sung a hymn they went out to the mount of olives so i'm going to show you something out of passover there's four cups and i'm going to kind of walk you through it because i think that it's uh, it's something that we can learn from but let me just say this for those i know that many of you are aware of this but i need to say this briefly at the beginning the the concept of blood covenant so in ancient times, just bear with me, River of Life, because I need to get this in this series. But in ancient times, in the Middle East, is the cradle of civilization. So every person alive on this planet, if you go back thousands of years, everybody originated out of the Middle East area. Okay, so that ancient culture that goes back to what was known as like Sumer and Babylon, there in the Middle East, there was... It, there was a um, concept of a blood covenant. And in America, in our culture, and I would say in the West overall, we have no concept of blood covenant whatsoever. The only thing that would even be remotely close would be a contract that uh, lawyers draw up some kind of contract, you sign it and make an agreement. But that's still nothing like a blood covenant. So for you and I to really truly understand what Jesus did on the cross, we need to have a concept of blood covenant. So let me just explain it for just a moment. If there were two families, two parties that wanted to come into a solemn blood covenant, what that meant was that your enemies become my enemies. I'm responsible for your life. I'm willing to lay down my life for you to live. I'm willing, if you go to war with your family, me and my family go to war the same way. If you die, we die with you. It was a very solemn, serious thing that you never entered into lightly. And so this is what they would do. Let's say that there were two parties that wanted to have that type of covenant in the ancient culture of the Middle East. Why was this advantageous? Because if you had covenant with somebody, if you ever got attacked, you had like somebody else that had your back that would come and defend you. So here's what would happen. Two parties wanted to come into a covenant. They would take an animal, they would kill it, and they would separate the pieces in, in half, and there would be a lot of blood on the ground. And the message was that if either one of us are not faithful to this covenant, may it be done to us what's done to this animal. That was just kind of the message that was sent, okay? And they would walk through that bloody soil like a figure eight, or walk in and stand in the middle, whatever, but they stood in that bloody soil. And here's what they would do. They would exchange some significant gifts, not something trivial, but something that really meant something to them. And they would give a gift to the other person. They would exchange those, and then they would exchange maybe some vows between the two parties. And after they finished that, they would sit and they would eat a meal together and that kind of closed it out when they ate a meal together but in that ancient culture if you go back and really study it they would even kind of cut something in their hand uh, with the knife and they would take and they'd rub some of that ash in it and make it scar on purpose and that's why in that ancient culture whenever people would approach another person and they would lift their hand and they would say peace be unto you if they saw a scar in that person's hand, they knew, now wait a second, if we jump this person and attack him, he's got some other people that are going to come and find us. And so it was a way of saying, I come in peace, peace be unto you, but if you're not a man of peace, there's somebody else that's going to come find you. And so in this culture, when you entered that blood covenant, it was a very solemn thing, and it was for a lifetime. Now, you can see that in Scripture in different places. For example, when David entered into a covenant with Jonathan. Do you remember that? How they exchanged very significant gifts. 
And it was for a lifetime. As a matter of fact, when David had come fully to power, he said, is there not anybody else in the house of Saul that I can show kindness to on Jonathan's behalf? And I think about also in the life of Abraham, that God had Abraham take and cut animals and separate them and actually separated, uh, I think there was four different pieces on each side and there was a lot of blood in that soil and Abraham walked through that bloody soil and as Abraham did God appeared to Abraham like a smoking pot and a flaming torch and some Bible scholars have said the smoking pot represents the the cloud uh, the cloud by day and the torch represent the fire by night of God's presence that would be with Abraham and his descendants but anyway nonetheless God cut covenant with Abraham and when he did, God swore to him, and it was an eternal thing. God said, I will never be unfaithful to this covenant. And God is still faithful to the seed of Abraham to this day. And God gave Abraham not a sign in his hand, but he gave him a sign through circumcision that his flesh would be marked, and so would his descendants. And I also can't help, there's a lot of different directions I could go about this, but let me say one more thing. Remember what I said about the hand, because there's a scripture in the Bible where it says that I have you in the palm of my hand. And Jesus, how many knows that Jesus kept the scars on purpose? How many knows Jesus could have allowed these scars on his hands to heal, but Jesus wants to remember what he paid for his blood covenant people when he looks at the palm of his hand, that he remembers and let me tell you something else. When you and I accept Christ, we enter into a solemn blood covenant for a lifetime with God who is faithful to his end of the covenant. And what happens, though, whether you want this part of it or not, is that, remember what I said, your enemies become his enemies, but also his enemies become your enemies. So have you noticed that before you accepted Christ, the devil kind of left you alone at least to a degree? But once you accepted Christ, all of a sudden, the enemy was really against you. See, Christ's enemies became your enemies. But the good news is, is that your enemies are also his enemies. All right, so just think about the God of blood covenant for a moment. Because the way that we approach God in prayer, this is probably the area when I pray and I come in, Jesus' name and through his blood, our Father, hallowed be your name. So I'm coming through the name and the blood, and I begin to hallow his name in worship, but it leads me into the communion table. And as I am meditating on and, and speaking out about the blood, the blood giving me access to the presence of God, I'm a son of blood covenant, and I get into this realm of the blood of Jesus, reverencing the blood, and remembering the blood covenant, that is when I feel the most intense presence of God in spiritual authority. Which, of course, leads me eventually into your kingdom come and will be done when you begin to use your authority. But it's the blood that brings you into the presence of God. So let me just give you some things as you take, how many take communion daily? Many of you do. So as you pray, this is a really powerful time as you're hallowing his name to, to stop for a moment and really take the Lord's Supper. Now for me, and you can do this as often as you desire and you can take communion a little bit differently than I do if you want to, but I'm just going to tell you the way I take it. It's kind of based on what God has shown me in the Passover meal from a New Testament perspective. And so I'll show you what I mean. There's four different cups at Passover, and I take communion when I do this. I'm taking of the bread and the juice four different times because I'm remembering the promises of God. Now, as we've entered into a blood covenant, and we're his blood covenant people, we understand. Now think about these words. If you say these words with faith, how powerful that they are. As I'm worshiping God, and I'm, I'm hallowing his name, and now... I'm moving into taking communion. Listen to what I'm saying to the Lord. And the enemy knows the power of this. Lord, I thank you that I'm a son of blood covenant. 
that I am a son of Abraham. And the oath and the blessings that you cut with Abraham are my inheritance right now. His blessings at work in my life today. But I'm the seed of Abraham. And because of the blood of Jesus, the blood of covenant has been cut on my behalf. That blood washes me clean. It justifies me and sanctifies me. It makes me the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm redeemed by your blood out of the hand of every enemy. Satan has nothing in me. He has no power over me. And because of the blood of Jesus, he has no unsettled claim to my life. There's no accusation he can hold up against me because the blood declares me forgiven. The blood brings me into your presence. And as, as a son of blood covenant, I thank you for my covenantal rights that I have in Christ that was paid for. Not because I deserve it, but because Christ has made it that way by his blood. That's just the way it is. And it's so powerful. And as the first time I take communion, it's just like the first cup at Passover. You guys have had a Passover meal with us, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. That first cup is the Kiddush. It's the cup of sanctification. And this is where I take time, not only on my behalf, but on behalf of the family, on behalf of, of the church. I take a moment to ask forgiveness for the sins and I go through the Ten Commandments, but I'm confessing, Lord, if there's anything in our lives, as in our family or in this church that hasn't pleased you, we confess it, we repent. And as I go through the Ten Commandments, I, I examine myself, and I take that first cup. But I want you to think about this. As I take communion on behalf of myself, I'm taking it also on behalf of my family and the church. Did you know that you can take communion on behalf of your family. As an, as an intercessory act. And you can, and those of us that, especially in leadership mainly, but we can take communion on behalf of the church. And this is the way I'm doing it, Lord. I thank you. I picture as I'm taking this, what represents the Lord's body and blood is going into my body and blood, but I want you to understand that our family and also this church, the Bible talks about us being like one body. Have you ever really thought about that? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he said, don't you know a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough that you're one body? And so does this make sense? And so as I'm taking communion, and I do this every day pretty much, I'm saying, Lord, I bring my family, I bring the church under the blood of Jesus. We are one in Christ, and I thank you, Lord, for a deep consecration. And see, it's all in the realm of faith in God's word. I thank you, Lord, that, that we are crucified with Christ. We no longer live. We're raised to new life. We're seated with you at the right hand of the Father, far above our rule, authority, power, and dominion. Not only that, but we're living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto you. The Bible says, as I take this, that we are the living, breathing temple of the Holy Ghost. Like the living, breathing tabernacle of Moses, the tabernacle of the Spirit. That's been fulfilled in us. The Lord used to dwell in a tent in the midst of his people. Now, we are like the living, breathing tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit indwells us. And let me just encourage you the power of this. As I'm taking communion on behalf of my family and the church, I feel the power of God. And I really believe this, that just like the head of the home at the story of Passover in Egypt, he was responsible to put the blood over the doorpost. In the same way, I believe that as, as a husband and father figure over the family and over the church as a pastor, I believe that this is a way of painting the blood over the doorpost of our lives. And I have to believe that it makes tremendous protection available. And so as I'm taking this vicariously on behalf of others, okay, this is the, the kiddush, the sanctification. So God is separating us. He's sanctifying us unto himself. And I personally believe that the elements, rep, they just represent the body and blood of Christ, okay? But God's in that, isn't he? And as you take those elements, you have to understand what represents Christ's body and blood is going into your stomach, into your body and your bloodstream. Think about that for a moment. 
It, there's no way to get around the fact that there's something supernatural about that. And it, it's like becoming one with Christ as you take communion. In a fresh way that day, it's like becoming one. And it's also coming under the blood, like painting the blood over your life and family, and in this case, the church, in a new and fresh way for that day. There's something so supernatural and powerful in this. When people get a revelation of it, and I want to say a couple things because I just want to mention this about the seriousness of the blood covenant and encourage people. Listen, before I get off this cup here of sanctification, did you know that somebody can go to church their whole life from the time they were a little kid up until they're 18, get out of church, and still go straight to hell when they die. Did you know that? Did you know that church doesn't save you? And did you know that no matter what, at the end of the day, what is really going to matter is that your heart is changed? It's one thing to put on a show, come to church, and just kind of go through the motions and all that. But God wants our heart. And if people really, if God, if God has our hearts so we're deeply in love with him and we're living for him because we love him, we want to honor him even when nobody's looking, even when nobody's around. Steve Hill used to teach some of us, what you do in secret is really a lot of who you really are. And see, God is looking at when nobody else is around, does God really have our hearts? And so I want to say that, and I also want to say something else before I get off this subject, because when I go through the Ten Commandments, one of them has to do with other gods. Did you know one of the gods that we, the idols we must repent of is the idol of self? I think that that's probably the worst and most evil idol that we can have is where we are our own God, and it's like self-worship. What does that look like? It looks like this. When somebody, they may talk good, but at the end of the day, they really truly don't care about anybody else too much, but they really are so selfish and self-centered, and it's all about what I can get out of it. It's about me. It's about using people. It's just totally selfish and self-centered. Listen, that's a dangerous place to be. And I encourage people to think about this because in that realm of the God of self, did you know that if we're not careful, this is, this is something really interesting to me. There's, a, there's something that's real powerful here if you can get this revelation. One of the great hindrances is caring too much about what other people think. Now, I understand that we're to live like a life that brings Christ glory and in that sense, we need to be concerned that the way we live isn't going to negatively affect someone else. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is if people reject you, it spins you out of control into a depression. I'm talking about if people pat you on the back and sing your praises, you get lifted up with pride. Why? Because you're too focused on what people think about you. Let me give you something that God has taught me. At the end of the day, you know, I can get up and preach with boldness tonight because of this reason. I don't come in this place overly concerned if everybody's going to like my sermon or pat me on the back at the end of it at all. I'm not really even thinking that whatsoever. What I'm thinking about is, God, you gave me this to preach. I'm going to do my best to deliver what you gave me. And then when I leave here, all I'm concerned about is what do you think about it? Because you, if you really hear from God and you preach the word, there's going to be people that can't stand you. And there's going to be other people that love you. But see, if, you're, if you care too much about what people think, that's what Paul was saying when he said to the Galatian church, if I'm, if I'm living to please men, I cannot be a bondservant of Christ. In other words, you're serving two masters. You cannot serve God and then serve what people think of you at the same time. Because if you're really serving the Lord, some people are not going to like it. Now, when I, when I do something, for example, tonight, ministry-wise, leave out of here, some people may, oh, that's great, that's wonderful, whatever. But you have to be careful with that because that can lead to pride. 
you cannot take seriously what people are saying about you because some people are too nice and they're going to they're going to sing your praises and encourage you and if you take that to heart it can get you all puffed up and then if you listen to the other crowd that hates you no matter what you do they're always going to hate you and be negative if you listen to that crowd, you'll get intimidated, you'll get it discouraged, you'll feel like you can never do anything right. You cannot let that affect you either way. Because either way, it is a trap of Satan that has to do with pride. And at the end of the day, it's, it's rooted in the idol of self. The idol of the praise of men. The more that we die to that completely, the more free we're going to be. Amen. And then we can just simply do what the Lord wants us to do and let the chips fall where they may. Whether people love you or hate you, whether you pack out a room or, or a room leaves, if you really truly did what God told you to do, you were faithful, then that's the end of it. That's all that really matters. I remember seeing there was a series of movies that were really good on the end times and Kirk Cameron was in them and it was the, uh, what, what were they called? The Tribulation? Left Behind series. Okay, there was one of them. It might be the, the first or second one, but it was early on. And there was a minister that had been left behind. That wasn't, he wasn't right. But I remember watching this, and, I, and it, I took notice of this, because all these people now, after the rapture, had come, and that this is going to happen one day. There, how many knows that the church is going to be full one day? Amen. Anyway, the rapture happens. Everybody comes to church. And so the, the preacher got up, and he was just preaching it straight, exactly like it was. And half the people left because they just didn't want to hear it. And the other half stayed because they really wanted the truth. Now, he was faithful to tell them the truth. Some of them didn't want it. The others did. He didn't go chasing after the people that didn't want it. So just keep this in mind because I think about Jesus in John chapter 6 when that crowd followed him and he said, you're following me just because I fed you food. And they all got mad at him and Jesus said, look, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part of me. And they all forsook him. And I tell you what we don't read in the Bible is Jesus getting on his hands and knees and running over there and begging them to come back either. Jesus was just concerned with what the Father, to us, what I see the Father doing, I do. What I hear him saying, I say. And then he let the chips fall. People don't want to hear it. They get offended. They leave. Hey, that's their choice. So this first cup, the Kiddush cup, has to do with sanctifying our lives unto God. If we'll be quick to repent, if we'll be quick to forgive people and live holy, how many knows that there is tremendous power in this? We want our bodies to be sanctified. We want to be holy unto God, okay? Then the second cup at Passover, and this is the second time. So I'm sitting here in my personal prayer time. You don't have to do it this way. It's just what I do. But I, I get some extra juice and a pretty good-sized piece of matzah. And so this second time I'm taking communion now, I'm thinking about not just sanctification. Now I'm thinking about deliverance. Because the second cup at Passover, the makot, is deliverance. And some of you will remember this part of it because this is where you go through the plagues and you dip your finger and, and, and your napkin is covered in little drops of, of what looks like blood. And, and it represents, for us, Jesus has fulfilled this, it represents the foot of the cross. Jesus hung on that tree in Galatians 3.13, becoming a curse for us. Cursed as he was hung on a tree. Blood dripped from his body. And what did he pay for? Our deliverance. And so this is where I'm now taking communion on behalf of me and my family in the church to be delivered from everything of the enemy. Everything that's trying to come against us, any mental and emotional oppression. And I begin to use my authority as I'm taking communion now. I begin to bind anything of the enemy that's been coming against me, that's been coming against my family, that's been coming against this church, to get out in Jesus' name. And many times because, you know, being a pastor, even to the north, south, east, and west, I'm speaking, give it up in Jesus' name what God has for us. We bind the enemy, you will release and give up what is ours. And so I begin to use my authority. And then I get to the third cup, a Passover called the Goela, and it means redemption. Now, this was the cup that Jesus used to give us communion today. Jesus was holding a Passover meal, 
And this is the cup because it said after the meal part. I don't have time to explain that. But he took that third cup of Passover and he, and he took the bread, probably the Afikoman bread that we're familiar with. But he took that bread, he broke it, and he gave communion to the people there. And it's as often as you desire. So I know that you guys have probably thought about this, and I've probably already said it, but think about it. This is a way for us to, to have like Passover all year long. That you're painting the blood over the doorpost of your life, over your family. That you're consecrating yourself unto God. This is powerful. Now, this part of it, I start thinking about healing and provision. Because the scripture talks about this, and I don't have the scriptures in front of me, but we've already covered this in this series, that though Christ was rich, he became poor, that through him we, be, we will be made rich. And that's 1 Corinthians. But it talks about there that the Lord wants to supply our needs. He wants to provide for us, okay? And I also think about healing. 1 Peter 2, 24 where it talks about that Christ bore in his body our sin, that we're dead to sin and alive unto righteousness, and by his stripes you were healed. So I think about healing and provision when I get to the Guela part of it, and I'm thinking, Lord, I, I thank you that first off, I'm consecrated unto you. Secondly, I am delivered from the power of the enemy. Now, thirdly, my needs are met, and, there's, and I have health, because of the covenant that you cut at Calvary. The cross is the place. Remember when I talked about the animal was cut in half and you stood in bloody soil? You got to understand, when Jesus was on that cross, that was where covenant was cut and blood was shed. And we share in that covenant. And God is faithful. Listen, if people will, will really truly get a revelation of blood covenant and let this really get in your spirit, it'll change your life. Because you'll view things very differently. You understand that it has nothing to do with you and it has nothing to do with your righteousness. It is simply the way that it is because of what Jesus did on that cross. That you can stand by faith at the foot of the cross in that bloody soil and say, Father, I thank you that you see me through Christ. You see me as the righteousness of God in Christ. And right now, there's covenant promises that, no, I don't deserve them, but Jesus paid for them nonetheless. And because of what he did, it is the rights of this covenant for my needs to be met. It is the rights that healing come. It is the covenant rights that I am delivered from the enemy. And when you really get this revelation, it's very humbling, isn't it? You're not lifted up with pride because you realize at the foot of the cross that I could have never earned this. I don't deserve this. But yet it's still mine. So what happens when you get this revelation is it makes you more humble and more thankful. But it also gives you a boldness and a confidence in God meeting your needs and doing this. Because why? Because God will be faithful to his end of the covenant. Now listen, there's, there's something to what I'm saying if people really get this. God is faithful to his covenant. And let me give you a story. That it's about the Isle of Hebrides. So there was a particular time in this great revival, which you're familiar with, and those that may hear this, maybe you're not. I don't have time to do this big, long thing. But for two years, the Holy Spirit poured out in the Isle of Hebrides, sovereign move of God. The whole area was shaken by the power of God. Okay. Duncan Campbell was ministering, but the Holy Spirit would always go before him, and he'd get there, and everybody would just be under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and get saved. But there was this one meeting where he was there, and it seemed hindered. If I remember right, I think that they were in a house. But nonetheless, he was there and it was being hindered. And there was a man. Now, see, this is what people have said about those in Hebrides. They said that the people there understood that God was a God of covenant. And they had gotten a hold of a promise that God would pour out water on dry land. This was in, it's in the scriptures. And they got a hold of that specific promise and they lay hold of it that dry and thirsty land would receive the water. And, they, and in this, this um, meeting, I'm pretty sure they were in a house. It was hindered. And there was a man that stood up and prayed. 
And he said this, to this effect, I do not remember the exact words, but he basically said this. He said something like, God, we're humble here today, but your integrity is at stake because you promised us that you would send water on thirsty land, and I'm thirsty. And so he understood that God would be faithful. And whenever he stood there in faith, and say, God, you are faithful, but your integrity is at stake. Whenever he prayed that, there was people that were there that said they, they, they heard like a rumbling, but the Lord just blew in that place and took over, and it was awesome. But understand that God is faithful to his covenant. A lot of people, for different reasons, get kind of offended, or they just different emotions and different mentalities and different strongholds and and things that go on internally in people's lives. But if, if people can truly get to that place where they understand God is so faithful to his covenant and his word and really lay hold by stubborn faith in the promises of God based on what Jesus did, I don't deserve it. But yet the blood declares that it will happen in my life because I am a child of blood covenant. And not only that, but whenever I'm taking communion, especially at the second cup about deliverance, I always, for some reason, picture this as well. Not only am I at the foot of the cross, that's usually the first cup. I, I just, in my mind, this is the way I am. This is just me. But I always picture myself in Galatians 3.13. It says that Christ became a curse for us. Curses is anyone who's hung on a tree redeeming us from the curse under the law so that the blessings of Abraham come on us. And I can show you other places where the Bible says that we're the seed of Abraham. So this is what I picture as I'm taking usually this second cup of deliverance, but I'm picturing that I'm walking through that bloody soil with Abraham. And I'm saying to the Lord, Lord, I thank you that I am of the seed of Abraham. And these oath and this, these blessings that you gave to Abraham, I'm the seed of Abraham. I share in this covenant that you cut with Abraham according to Galatians 3, 13 and 14. And just what you did to Abraham is my inheritance right now. And I'm just going to be honest with you. It's during this time that I'm putting a lot of emphasis on the blood, on the blood covenant, on worship. I always welcome the Holy Spirit and talk to him too. But I'm telling you, it's during this time that I usually feel an awesome presence of God come in. And you know why that is? Because it doesn't have anything to do with me. It has to do with the blood covenant. See, the blood covenant was this. In Hebrews, it says that we can approach into the most holy place, the holy of holies. How? By the blood you see what I'm saying? Once we get the revelation that the blood gives us access into the Holy of Holies, and that blood was sprinkled. See, they took the blood in the tabernacle in the courtyard area, and they would take hyssop, and they would sprinkle the blood on things to make it holy. And Hebrews says that our consciences have been sprinkled. And then it says your body's washed with pure water, that we can enter the most holy place. And so on that third cup, going back to where I left off, as I'm thinking about healing and scriptures about healing and provision, this is a good time to speak the word of God. It's a good time to use your authority to break the power of the enemy as well over any of these specific areas, but also speak in blessings. Again, I may have to do a whole sermon. I may do that actually because a lot of people do not even know what blessings are. So, for example, somebody may be walking down the road and find a $20 bill and say, oh, what a blessing. Well, okay. But really, truthfully, if people really understood what a blessing actually is, it's something that you speak and it's put on your life and you carry that blessing. So all the good things that happen is actually a result of a blessing on your life, if you will. But anyway, I, I'm going to preach probably a sermon just on blessings because as you begin to speak blessings, I'm not talking about prophesying or, or faith confessions or quoting scripture. I'm talking about by faith putting a blessing on people and places and situations and circumstances. You bless it 
First Peter 3 9 says so that you bless it so that you will inherit a blessing it will turn things for you so this is a good time to speak blessings it's a good time to quote scripture and okay and then we move on well I have actually have the scripture in my notes first Peter 3 8 through 9 finally be all of one mind be loving toward one another be gracious be kind do not repay evil for evil or curse for curse but how many knows it's easy to curse for curse you know people want to speak about you in a negative way it's so easy to turn around and talk trash about them isn't it in our flesh wants to you know people wrong you what does your flesh want to do oh well, i'll get them back and we all deal with that because we're just human but the bible says this if you if you will stop and not do that but on the contrary bless knowing that to this you were called that you might inherit a blessing that doesn't necessarily mean here in this context that you're doing something for them what that means is is that you're speaking a blessing see i'm gonna have to do a, a sermon that will explain this more thoroughly but when you speak a blessing over a person it begins to turn things in your favor blessings will cause things to happen it will change situations there's many stories i could give an example in my life and in others lives of stories i've heard about blessings that's so powerful but blessings will turn things around and so if people are cursing you what you can do is you can speak a blessing let's say that there's some people that hate you and are trying to destroy you trying to get you fired in the workplace well first off bind the devil in their life but then you can say in jesus name i bless so and so as the bible tells me to but i speak a blessing that i will be honored and favored with you i bless you that god is turning this thing in my favor i bless you that your heart is going to get right with god and you're going to begin to perceive me differently and our relationship will change and there'll be warmth and love and peace between us because the bible says that if our ways please god we even have peace with our enemies and so i bless you in jesus name and you have faith that what you're speaking is going to turn that situation but if you get in the muck and mire with those people and you begin to talk trash about them and you start gossiping about them and you try to get them fired and you start trying to repay evil for evil curse for curse you watch because it's not going to get better for you it may get worse the bible's trying to teach us here this doesn't have to do with forgiveness forgiveness is a choice this is after you forgive the person God is saying let me give you a secret a key that will turn negative situations around for you supernaturally what would have possibly brought destruction can literally turn around in your favor and finally I get to the last cup the Hallel which is the cup of praise and this is where I thank God for his faithfulness. And I think about this. What did Jesus say? It says, do this in remembrance of me till I come. Have we ever really thought about this, that the communion table, what if David saw something? I understand David saw a Passover. But I wonder with prophetic eyes if David possibly saw the communion table down the road when he said this. He said that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In that passage, he said, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And he will anoint my head with oil and my cup will overflow. I wonder if the communion table doesn't do something to us spiritually that helps us get filled with extra oil as a bride that the lord's coming for who wise virgins with extra oil and garments without spot or blemish that maybe god has given us some type of a supernatural table if you will where our garments can be washed is everybody hear what i'm saying where our garments can be washed that we can be filled with extra oil that we find some kind of refuge in that and that that it's helping to prepare us isn't it interesting that jesus said do this in remembrance of me and then he talks about till i come it makes me think 
that maybe there's something about the communion table that's going to at least help us be ready for when he comes. Because we're examining ourselves. I personally believe, this is just my opinion, that there's something about the communion table that is extremely supernatural. And that it does something to us spiritually. It's not just a symbol. But I believe that it really does something spiritually to us. In fact, Derek Prince said this. I never forgot this because I believe it's true. He said there's a lot of people in this world that will never take Holy Communion. They're not God's people. And Derek was talking about John chapter 6 when Jesus said, Eat my flesh, drink my blood. And he said, if, if, And you will have life in you. If it, you remember reading that? Jesus talked about eating his flesh, drinking his blood. He said, you'll have life. And Derek said this. He said, at the end, what's going to happen? We're going to be raised from the dead. Now, listen to what he said. He said his opinion was that when we take communion, that he thinks it does something supernatural to our physical bodies that is preparing us for the resurrection of the dead. Because when the rapture happens, the dead in Christ are going to rise. Your body is going to raise from the dead and going to be glorified. That's interesting, isn't it? Isn't that an interesting thought? And so I personally believe because of even experiences, not just scripturally, but experiences of what I have felt when I take communion on behalf of myself and my family and the church and I do it vicariously, I have felt something so supernaturally powerful. I believe that when I take communion, it does something that pushes hell back. You know why? Because of the Passover blood over the doorpost, the enemy is pushed back. And it basically, it's like saying, you cannot trespass here. You can't bring death and destruction here because the blood of Jesus is over the doorpost here. It's basically saying to the devil, you cannot just hang around and oppress either because I am delivered out of the hand of my enemies by the blood. And because of the blood Jesus shed in his back, healing comes. And there's something about that stubborn faith that stays with the covenant rites until you see it manifest. But anyway, as I close out, take four times, it's just the way I do it. That you don't have to do it this way. But as I take it this fourth time, I'm thanking the Lord to be a bride without spot or blemish, ready to meet him in the air, that I'm filled with extra oil, and I'm doing this in remembrance of him until I come. So think about it. At Passover, you know, I always kind of joke around with you guys and say as we have the, the Passover meal, it's an illustrated sermon of the Lord's Last Supper. But basically, I say this to you guys, just kidding around, but it's like taking communion on steroids, which it is, because we're going through all that Jesus did for us on the cross. And so this is just a pattern that I do. But as I take communion first, I'm thanking the Lord that I am washed and covered in the blood of Jesus, the righteousness of God in Christ. Satan has nothing in me and nothing over me because of the blood. The second time, I am delivered from the hand of every enemy, Satan must back off. The third time, I thank you, Lord, that your blood, the covenant rights of being healed and, and taken care of financially. And then the fourth time, that I'll be a bride without spot or blemish, ready with extra oil to meet the Lord in the air. Isn't that powerful? So as we begin to slow down in life a little bit and take time to pray, if you have to get up early, if you have to stay up late, whatever you've got to do to make room for a prayer life. Listen, I, I close with this. Remember what Steve Hill said. Don't just talk about it, do it. And here's the thing. I personally believe this with all my heart. I do not believe that everybody that goes to church, everybody that calls themselves a Christian is going to be raptured. I do not believe that. I've never believed that. When Jesus comes, he's coming for a bride that's made herself ready. And in every big group of people, there's some that's made themselves ready and there's some that have not. How many knows what I'm talking about? You don't have to be in church long in, in most places, excuse me, 
to know that there are people that are sold out and on fire for God and they live a holy life and they have a powerful prayer life and they're going after God. Those are the people Jesus is coming back for. And then you know that there's others that are not really living a holy life. They're, they're just messing around. They're, they're not really, you know, they don't have any type of prayer life. I believe personally that Enoch was the very first person in the Bible to be referenced with the rapture. And I believe he was a picture and type of the end time bride that will be ready when the Lord comes. God's going to pour out his spirit again all over the world. And I believe that the true, <clears throat> excuse me, the true remnant bride is going to become a people of prayer. And those that pray are going to be without spot or blemish, filled with extra oil, and they're going to be ready when it's time. Does this make sense? So it's all about getting ourselves ready to meet him in the air, isn't it? So, Lord, I thank you as we close this time out. I thank you for this word. I thank you for getting this in us. We want to be a people that is, we're not just going to church and going through the motions, but we're a people that are living a holy life, we have a prayer life. We're filled with extra oil. We're looking for your coming. We're, we're going to be ready when you come. And Lord, I thank you for getting that in our spirit tonight. And even tonight, as, as I talked about the covenant, Lord, give us faith in the God who is faithful to your covenant. Lord, you are faithful to every part of the blood covenant, even though sometimes people are not faithful, even though at times we haven't always been faithful in all things. You remain faithful. And Lord, help us to have great faith in what Jesus has done for us on the cross. That faith in the God who is faithful to that blood covenant, the covenant rights, the covenant promises, that we will stand by faith at the foot of the cross and lay hold of all the promises of God that was laid on Christ, that when that covenant was cut, that blood was shed, these promises are available to us now. Help us, Lord, to have faith in the covenant. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I want to pray for you tonight. <clears throat> I have really felt God moving deeply in the altar time last couple weeks. And I want to pray.